I've been given a second chance of life because of this program, because of the community of AA, um, which I didn't have a community before this. I'm still a new person in a new town with no friends. And all of a sudden, like, I've got 20 people that care about me. This is what it's all about. I I heard heard it through the the grapevine. Welcome. It's the AA Grapevine Half Hour Variety Hour, featuring the collected voices of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm Sam, an alcoholic in Palm Springs, California. And I'm Don, an alcoholic in Greensboro, North Carolina. Don! Oh my god, it's so good to see you. It's like I haven't been sitting here bantering with you and just like (laughs) you in the fat for the past half hour. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) Well, it's good to see you too, Sam. You're looking fresh and sparkly. (laughs) I took a bath. (laughs) That's good. Luckily, and I'm happy for this, Zoom so far has not got smell-o-vision. Oh, we are going to get some smell-o-vision going on. We got to do it. Sam, have you got your passport in order? I do. My passport, I had to renew it a couple of years ago, so I'm good because I know what you're alluding to. Yeah, I got my passport ready because I'm thinking ahead towards the convention that's going to be in Vancouver, the international, what's the name of it? The international. <laughs> Let's go to aa.org. We better get the actual title of it. And Let's look up. I think we can do this real time here, too. Now I'm going to click on the search icon, and I'm going to type in International Convention and see what shows up. And here we have International Convention. So, for instance, frequently asked questions about the 2025 International Convention and travel to Canada. Uh, that's See, this is the thing to think about because... Alcoholics tend to have, some of us, have had little problems with the law from time to time. (laughs) Yeah, and so there are some considerations to consider uh, if uh, you are planning to go to that convention because uh, Canada does have some laws in place that uh, can prove to be hurdles. So uh, I definitely recommend going to uh, aa.org and search for International Convention there, and then click on the FAQs. They were last updated at the end of uh, March 29 as of this recording, and uh, so they're keeping them fresh. The International Convention only meets every five years, and we had to skip the last one. Yep, 2020 was a bust. So it's going to be exciting. this one is fast approaching. It's next year. It's next year, and it'll be my first. It'll be my second. I got to go to the one in Atlanta. Very cool. Don, I recently read something on social media that just, like, I as, as soon as I read it, I, I sent it to you and Alice because I'm like, we got to talk about this. It is a fantastic analogy for recovered versus recovering. You know, we've got that fantastic little uh, controversy. Yes. Are you recovered or are you recovering? Yes. By golly, I'm recovered. (laughs) No, I am recovering. This thing is, listen to this. It's both. Think of a refrigerator. The goods inside are both refrigerated and refrigerating. If you unplug the refrigerator, the refrigerated goods stop refrigerating and spoil. We are in a spiritual process. We can't outgrow a spiritual process. If we unplug, we stop refrigerating and eventually are not refrigerated anymore. So if we stop, we begin to stink. (laughs) <laughs> Back to the smell of it. <laughs> there you go. I am recovered and recovering yeah. because it requires active recovering for me to stay recovered. recovered. Yeah, I've never been bothered by the controversy one way or the other. I, I feel I am both. And I understand the point of both of them. Yeah. I mean, the point of being recovered is AA works. And I can recover from the disease of alcoholism, and I'm recovering 
because if I feel like that I am recovered and can quit going to AA, that can lead me right back to drinking. So to bear in mind that this is a disease and I am recovered as long as I take the medicine, which it grows something like penicillin is a mold. So it would grow like on food, for example, that was not refrigerated. <laughs> I was wondering where in, that was going. Okay. I'm okay. tying in your analogy there with a the refrigerator. That reminds me, I need to go clean out the refrigerator. It's been a minute. <laughs> All right. Well, Sam, who's our guest today? Oh, good. We're getting to that part. <laughs> Don, today we welcome Nathan L. from Harrisonburg, Virginia. Also, we're going to ask Nathan a newcomer question from our new segment, A Newcomer Asks. Folks, we need you to write or call 212-870-3418 with questions. Yeah, we need you to help that new shy person by sending us questions that you asked as a newcomer or questions that you have been asked by a newcomer or a sponsee. Those are the types of things we're looking for. Yep, and if you write, because, you know, we are alcoholics, we always want more, don't <laughs> just send one question. No, <laughs> send in a few. Sit down with your friends at coffee after the meeting, you know, and come up with a list and send it to us at podcast at aagrapevine.org. We'd really appreciate it. Or call 212-870-3418. Or bring it up in your home group business meeting and y'all can talk about it for 35, 40 minutes. <laughs> and while you're at it, why don't you settle whether we are recovered or recovering? And we should talk about having cookies, too. Where are we going to keep them? In the refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, folks. We need your stories on the individual traditions. Pick one and write about your or your group's experience with it. How has a tradition played a part in your life? How has your understanding of a tradition changed? What is a personal experience where a tradition played a part? Visit aagrapevine.org for guidelines and to submit. Hi guys, uh, I am Nathan L. I'm from Harrisonburg, Virginia. My sobriety date is January 25th of 2023. And I'd suppose my home group is the Young and Sober group here in Harrisonburg, which we just got started in the fall. Fantastic. It's a new group? Yeah, new group in Harrisonburg. Um, kind of sprung out of my first six months of sobriety and, you know, feeling a little troubled by not seeing a lot of the younger faces because, you know, during my time I and, and listening to you guys on the podcast, you know, I know that there are a lot of people unlike myself who got sober very young, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old. And, you know, I, I didn't see those young faces. And, you know, I live in a town with three college institutions within a 20 minute drive. And uh, I know because I work in higher ed, my wife works in higher ed, that um, there are a number of people that could use help that it could probably serve bit some benefit to this community. So cool. You know, Nathan, I got to tell our listeners, first of all, you and Don and I have kind of an ongoing relationship yeah. that started back in April of last year when you emailed us and yeah. we've been emailing back and forth periodically since then. And the things that you have done that you've shared, I mean, you starting a group because you weren't seeing those people in the meetings. That's fantastic. Oh my God. That's something that I don't hear someone in their first year doing that. I do so with tons of humility, right? Because that's what we, what we have to do. Um, this is truly a meeting to try to fit and fill a need. I knew how intimidating it was for me to walk into my local club for the first time. And I was 43, right? Uh, I can't imagine what it's like for someone who's 18 or 23 or 27. Do you have a couple of people coming? 
Yeah, I mean, I was actually really surprised this last week. We had 10 people and three of them were brand new faces. And that was huge. That's happening. I, that's yeah. a happening meeting. That was huge. So, but I listened to you all. You all taught, have taught me a lot about the idea of service and how essential service is to sobriety. Uh, you know, of course, my sponsor talks about it with me a lot too. It's not so much a frequent topic in the rooms I'm in sometimes, but sponsorship works, uh, AA outside of the rooms with the podcast and reading works. So listen, I was in, had my back against what I felt like was such a wall that I had to do something different, you know, and I had to commit to whatever you all told me to do. Even you guys that were just talking at me th through my phone, like I was trying to do it. So Nathan, we know because we've been following your recovery from that three months when you wrote in, what happened to you that brought you into AA to your first meeting? I was at really the lowest time, the rock bottom for me. Just a whole bunch of things, right? Coming out of the pandemic, we moved here because of a wife's job and support her. You know, I have two beautiful kids uh, that I adore. But um, I just hit a point where I was trying to feel better by drinking. And then I was feeling terrible because of my drinking. And you know, I was just in this terrible cycle and it just, you know, made me more depressed. And I had found uh, myself uh, going to pick up my daughter. I thought I was perfectly fine to drive and picking her up from an after school program, bringing her home and then finding myself in a single car accident where my car was in a ditch. And that led me to a place that I never, ever thought I would be. And uh, my wife came up to me the night after um, uh, the night she came and uh, did think something she never thought she was going to be doing, which was bailing me out. And she said, listen, I, I think it's time. I think you need to go to an AA meeting. And that alcoholic voice that I ha always had in my head, which is, no, I got this. You know, the, the, yeah. I no, I'm good. I'm good. I got this. I'll figure this out. Yeah. I had a moment of intervention from, I'll call it my higher power, right? And it said, do not effing say that, Nathan. And I just looked at her and I said, yeah, you're right. And I went to my first meeting um, Thursday night. The, I think it was the 26th um, at, at actually, ironically, my church um, and was met by three or four people in a room. And um, they showed me the ways. They picked me up. They listened to me cry. I've still got a paper towel um, that was handed to me to help dry my face by uh by a great guy that i that i spend a fair amount of time with uh as my big book page marker you know bookmark <laughs> I, love I love that oh wow it's a little nerdy but it's like well i needed a bookmark and this paper towel's got some symbolism to it now right so. yes <laughs> yeah you know i nathan i got absolute chills when you were talking about your wife said that and the the voice in your head was like, do not say what you normally would say here. Yeah. Talk about a moment of surrender, a moment of letting go. That is it. That moment where an option is presented and we take it. It was surrendered following the in the footsteps of every person. You guys said work in 90 and 90. I was like, are you freaking kidding me? That's nuts. <laughs> and for the new, for the people who have not yet gone to a meeting, what is 90 and 90? <laughs> 90 meetings in 90 days. And I want to say I got 93 meetings in or something in 90 days. And I <laughs> kept that going because I'm like an overachiever. Um, <laughs> I did like, I probably by the end of my first year, I think I had done maybe 370 to 375 meetings in 365 days. So I was actually scared for a while of what was going to happen if I didn't go to a meeting. I was the same way, Nathan. It's like every time I go to a meeting, I would feel better. And yeah. it, it did more than just help me not drink. It helped me deal with the world. And it's like, now I want to go every day because this is where the answer is. It took a while for me. And anytime you guys in the rooms were laughing about stuff, I was like, 
I want you to be pissed like me, you know, <laughs> stop having yeah. fun and laughing. You bunch of, don't you see what I'm going through? You know, Nathan, I am so glad you're talking about that because that is an important thing to, to be realistic about, yeah. you know, when I came into the rooms, I, I stopped drinking and I, I was going to meetings and, you know, and I had a stop, start, stop, start history, but um, in short, I've taken away the only thing in my life that feels like a solution to feeling like crap all the time, even though it makes me feel like crap all the time now. And you people are jumping all over my last nerve and it is raw. Yeah, my sponsor still says, oh yeah, I, we could tell the instant you walked in, you're like, you're a new guy and you're in a pickle. And somehow that's gotten passed on to me at this point. It's like, oh, yeah, this guy is not doing well. So I got to say something to him by the end of the meeting. So, And that's the second part of it. Yes, because we've been there. And mm -hmm. so newcomer yeah. coming into these rooms, thinking about coming into these rooms, the people in this room that you're going to walk into have been there. We know what you're going through and you're not alone. And some of us are going to reach out and say hi. We hope you come back. That sense of community has been super critical to not like just survival, but uh, you know, there's there's survive, but then there's thrive, right? Like yes. surviving for us is is a lot about just like just don't drink, go to meetings, and then there's thrive, which is working on and treating this program as and sponsorship and everything else like you know, it's a plan for living, which we talk about, right? I don't want to survive. As I work through the steps, God has removed that, the, the desire for me to drink from me. I'm trying to move to the whole, I'm ready to learn how to live now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've known some folks over the years who got sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. They never worked a step. They never drank another drop in their life. And they are miserable people to be around. Can you put your finger on a time frame in the past year or so where you switched from surviving to thriving? You know, I think it's a little like the third step. Um, and, and real quick, step three, yeah. made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. And I believe in a Christian God. And, um, but I still didn't know, like, how what's the litmus test I, my sponsor i love him to death he's like nathan you do this every single day <laughs> you know the, step one is the step that you have to do com completely and fully step three is the, one of the ones you have to do every single day and doing meditation doing prayer um listening to you guys and some of the other sobriety related podcasts i do helps define for me whether I am thriving or just surviving. So some days are better than others. Nathan, can you think back to a time when you were in that state of fighting and something happened where it changed for you? So you weren't fighting and you were now going, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm all in. Well, I think there's two things. One was the idea of being able to attach the label of alcoholic to myself right the first four or five meetings i went to i said i'm nathan and i don't know if i'm an alcoholic or not i just i had to be honest and i didn't know how to define that for myself and you know and then i started to move into just going ahead and introducing myself that way because i'd probably made it through the first hundred pages of the big book by that point and i was like yeah yeah i got problems um <laughs> but then <laughs> Then it was somebody in a meeting that said, it's not how much you drink. It's not how frequently you drink. It's what happens to your brain when you do drink. And for me, that was like, boom, because I was not a daily drinker. I was not waking up in the morning and taking a slug out of a bottle of bourbon, but it just got so miserable at the end. And when it came down to it, I realized my brain works differently from the first time I took a drink when I was probably 16 years old. The second thing that I would say it, that was really powerful to me, somebody talked about service and service is the path to long-term sobriety. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can use this. This can be part of my story. I don't have to be ashamed of this. It's just part of who I am. 
but I can help others, other people like me. And that, and that was like the first moment of inspiration in early sobriety was you can be of service. You can help other people with this. Nathan, um, you know, this, this is one of those opportunities where we could have a four hour podcast episode. Sure. Um, (laughs) Not really. I'm not that interesting. Trust me. (laughs) The conversation is so good. I'm really enjoying this. And we have to move on. <laughs> so yeah. we're going to move on to the next segment, which is A Newcomer Asks. And this is where we're going to read a question that was sent to us. And we want to hear your take on it. And we're going to talk about it. So it's just going to kind of start a, another conversation in that regard. So still about we're still talking about recovery. And we're talking about our recovery. Yes. Absolutely. All right. So uh, this is an email we received from Craig Ale. Craig Ale. Man, the, <laughs> oh, the, the Southern Ale. showed up there. <laughs> Ale. No, we, Ale. Got, we got an email from Craig Ale. <laughs> this is an email from Craig L. in Reston, Virginia. <laughs> and with the subject, the newcomer asks question I had in early sobriety. Craig writes, Hi, Don, Sam, and Dallas. When I got sober in 2013, one of the most confusing questions on my mind was, what do I actually share about at meetings? Being a newcomer at the time, I heard a lot of people sharing about the 12 steps, the importance of a sponsor, and working the program. The speed bump I ran into as a newcomer was that I didn't know anything about any of that. Everyone in meetings seemed so insightful and eloquent and able to put complete thoughts together into sentences about how they're working the program in their daily lives, and it was all gibberish to me. The only words I was able to sheepishly jumble together were, I don't want to drink. I always felt welcomed and wanted, but I was so insecure about speaking up because I didn't know what to say. Having the opportunity to help a newcomer feel comfortable opening up in a meeting about what's going on in their life is a wonderful gift, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on how you communicate this with newcomers. Thank you. Craig, thanks for the email. Well, he kind of answered his own question there at the end. I love that. Helping the newcomer feel comfortable about opening up in a meeting about what's going on in their life is a wonderful gift. Nathan, so you're you're at one year. Did you struggle with this? Not really. I mean, I'm kind of like a you get what you see kind of person. (laughs) You know, my sponsor told me that the newcomer is the very most important person in the room. And he says regularly to me that, that it's the newcomer that helps him stay sober. And I was just able to give him a 35 year chip like a oh, couple wow. weeks ago. Nice. Uh, I'm a big believer that my higher power speaks through other people. And so if he's speaking through other people, I better freaking be listening. So it does help to listen, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was uh, real lo- loquacious and I was I overshare. Was. Oh, and, sorry. You know, sorry. Well, <laughs> well, you know, it's not a person who is shy with words and says little sentences and then sits in silence. That's not the type of person who becomes a podcast host. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a point there. Okay. We're talkers. <laughs> I'll allow that. <laughs> yeah. We're big talkers. So I was kind of told to hold it down. <laughs> Just shut up and listen a little bit. So there are those who will say, it, you know, you don't need to be sharing anything. We don't want to hear the mess. <laughs> we want to hear the message of recovery. So I think it's like there is a little bit of a balance there, but what to share, what to share is what's going on in my life? What are my questions about what y'all are saying? And how in the world is this going to work? Yeah, I'm a believer that everything actually happening in our lives is tied into our recovery. So I don't make that distinction. But That's not just for the newcomers. That's yeah. all of us. Mm-hmm. There's another thing that's going on here. And so first thing that popped to mind with this was, oh my God, utilize your sponsors, folks. Throw them under the bus. What do you mean throw them under the bus? I'm going there. Even if you don't have something to share in the meeting, sharing in a meeting, speaking up makes me a part of. 
It makes me a part of that group more than just sitting there. And so one of the things that you can do is throw your sponsor under the bus and say, Hi, I'm Sam. I'm an alcoholic. And my sponsor said that I need to share in meetings. And I don't know what to share, but I here you go. I see. Yes. Throw them under the bus. Do the same thing when it comes to calling people. My sponsor told me I have to call people, so I'm calling you. Throw your sponsor under the bus, people. <laughs> That it's a great use of a sponsor. Um, <laughs> but the other thing that, that showed up for me listening to you two talk about this is a number of sponsees that I have worked with over the years came up to me after the meeting to ask me about sponsorship when I shared the crap that was going on in my life right then and what I was doing about it. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a really important thing for us to do that. Um, I may not have all the answers, so I'm going to share about this thing. And what I'm done, what am I doing about it? So this thing happened in my life today, and I have had a horrible day, and I don't want to drink, and I don't have a desire to drink, but I don't want to allow this type of thing to keep on going. And so here's what I'm doing about it. I have prayed. I have called my sponsor. I'm now sitting in a meeting talking about it. That's practical action that when conveyed shows people that these are actions that we take as part of this fellowship in order to maintain our sobriety, sometimes just survive Mm -hmm. and hopefully move that survival into thriving, right? Nathan, this has been great having you here. Now, you've sent us a message every time you've picked up a chip. I hope you'll continue. Absolutely. To do that. Yeah, I probably, I've got my chips right here in a little case that my wife bought for me. On my one-year anniversary, she actually got me this uh, quote, and I don't know if you guys are uh, Ted Lasso fans, but there's oh, yeah. a lot of yeah. really great inspirational stuff. So it's this really big sign that's right above my whiteboard. It says, I hope that either all of us or none of us are judged by the actions of our weakest moments, but rather by the strength we show when and if we are ever given a second chance. Nathan, you inspire me. I am so grateful to know you. Thank you for reaching out over a year ago and letting us know what was going on and keeping that going. You, um, I, I hope that we get to sit in the same meeting side by side someday. Nathan, <laughs> thanks a million. The Grapevine strives to be self-supporting. Please subscribe to the magazine or app and visit the Grapevine online store. The app is free in your phone's app store and has great content and features provided at no cost to you. But if you subscribe, you get so much more and you support all things Grapevine, including this podcast. Oh, yeah. Only $2.99 a month. I found that a fourth step inventory is one of the ways we effectively clean house. You don't say. If I have a sponsee who has a lot of clutter in their home, I start them writing their inventory. Amazingly, their house gets spotless. Then I remind them to do their fourth step. (laughs) (laughs) It's really not that funny. Thanks for joining us. The AA Grapevine Half Hour Variety Hour is posted every Monday and is produced by AA Grapevine, Inc. We don't speak for AA as a whole. We share the experience, strength, and hope of members to help others recover from alcoholism. Podcast info, including how to call in, is at aagrapevine.org slash podcast. Search AA Grapevine in the App Store on your phone or find AA Grapevine on Instagram and YouTube. All things Grapevine are available at aagrapevine.org. If you want to know more about AA, search online for Alcoholics Anonymous in your city or visit aa.org. That was freaking amazing.
Uh, Don, I, I have been out or down through North Carolina. I'll buy you some barbecue. Just remember, though, I don't want to get into a fight, Don, but I'm originally from Missouri and I, I identify with Kansas City. And so there's that whole Kansas City, Carolina barbecue. There's totally oh, different. Oh, it's a totally different thing. No, we'll uh, fight over it. That at, sounds at like an outside issue, gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, nope. are you, you're, you're chairing the meeting now and redirecting the <laughs> like, no, no, no. Yeah, that's after the meeting, you guys. The barbecue <laughs> fight is like the recovered or recovering fight. Yeah, it's truly. They're both really good food. And you better put it in the refrigerator or it'll spoil. <laughs>